Chaos and violence continue to rack Wisconsin. Protesters try to mob D.C. diners into pledging fealty to Black Lives Matter. And the Trump campaign rolls out the second night of the RNC. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stop putting your online data at risk. Get protected at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, the country is in chaos. I mean, it's impossible to look at the images coming out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and not feel that something is fundamentally broken in our society. Violence broke out again in Kenosha last night. I look forward to the statements of empathy from Vice President Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and from Governor Tony Evers. We heard politicians on all sides of the Democratic Party discussing the evils of America, the systemic racism of the United States, discussing the awful, terrible, evil Kenosha Police Department without full evidence being in, in the Jacob Blake shooting, based on fragmentary video taken from a distance without any lead up, without any understanding of what exactly happened. Well, now there have been more shootings in Kenosha. There are businesses that have burned down in Kenosha. It turns out that when you slander all police officers as systemically racist, when you say the country is systemically racist, when you make excuses for rioters and looters and people who would do violent assault to other human beings, when you do all of those things, and then you incentivize the police to move out, well, what happens to follow is quite terrible. Last night in Kenosha, three people were shot. I look forward to the lamentations and empathy from all of these same Democratic figures. Perhaps they will, because it turns out that some of the people who were shot were some of the protesters. It turns out that According to various media reports, and the information is still coming in, it is unclear who was shooting and who was shot. It appears that the quote-unquote protesters, who in this case were rioters and looters, were shot, and that some of the people who may have done the shooting may have been. It is unclear, again, at this point, people who are defending their, for example, car dealerships against looters who are attempting to loot those car dealerships. So perhaps the Democrats will sound off about that. We've seen some evidence of that so far already. If it is rioters or looters, obviously, doing the violence, that is a different thing then we will just not mention it or pretend that it doesn't exist or pretend that it is all justified. In any case, here was the New York Times report on what happened. And by the way, it is worthwhile noting the real reporting on the ground is being done by center right outlets. It's being done by the Daily Caller. It's being done by townhall.com. It is not, in fact, being done by anybody in the mainstream media who are just cribbing off the work of these right wing outlets, mainly because it turns out that so many of these insane mainstream left wing outlets have decided that it was totally not worth even covering all of this stuff these were all, this was all just normal goings of, about a business. It, it was left to center right outlets to actually cover what's going on on the ground. So according to the New York Times, three people were shot early on Wednesday, two fatally, according to law enforcement officials, during a chaotic night of demonstrations over the shooting of Jacob Blake, a black resident whose children were nearby as their father was shot this week by a white police officer. Now, they're not going to tell you the full story of Jacob Blake. There are new details that are emerging in the shooting of Jacob Blake. We'll discuss that in a moment because... As it turns out, we now have a spate of high-profile police-involved shootings in which you have not been told the full story, or police killings in which you have not been told the full story. And then when new details emerge, it actually does extraordinary, extraordinary chaos to the original narrative that was trotted out by the media. We'll get to those in a second. According to the New York Times in Kenosha, a third night of protests over the shooting of Mr. Blake, I like third night of protests. It's not protests when you're burning crap and trying to wreck cars and setting things on fire. That's not a protest. That's a riot. And the media don't get to play this game where when President Trump condemns rioters and looters or when people on the right condemn rioters and looters, they say, ah, you're just trying to shut down First Amendment approved protest. And then as soon as you say, no, 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 the protesters are different than the rioters and looters, they say, no, they're all part of the same group. OK, well, you can't have it both ways. Either they are or they ain't. But people who are running around in the streets trying to break stuff and do violence to people are not, in fact, protesters. They are, in fact, rioters and looters and people who are violating criminal law. In Kenosha, a third night of protests over the shooting of Mr. Blake stretched into the early morning hours of Wednesday after demonstrators clashed with law enforcement officials near the county courthouse downtown. Tuesday evening was spent in a shifting hours-long standoff between police and protesters. Protesters assembled outside a newly erected metal barrier protecting the courthouse and threw water bottles, rocks, and fireworks at the police. And we can actually see all of this stuff happening. Here's some rioters trying to tear down the fence outside the Kenosha County Courthouse and chucking fireworks at the police. This would be clip five. So you can see these these rioters trying to do violence. Here they are trying to punt. I mean, this looks like Portland, right? Here they are. And it is not just people of color. You're seeing a lot of white faces in this crowd. A lot of white faces pushing the Black Lives Matter movement here. A lot of dispossessed white people, woke white jackasses, shining lasers into the eyes of police officers, throwing objects at police officers. These are not demonstrators. These are now rioters. Once you attack police officers, you are now a rioter. People were burning flags outside the fence, burning American flags. Always a good look. 
By the way, for the Republican National Convention, honestly, they should just live stream this. They really should, because this is what Democrats allow to happen in their states. Because as it turns out, Governor Tony Evers, the jackass governor of Wisconsin, he was offered more National Guard by the federal government. He turned it down. We'll get to that in a moment as well. Now, this is a continuation of a trend that has been happening overnight. We're going to get back to these shootings that happened in Kenosha in just a second. There's been a trend that's been happening over the course of the last 48 hours. And it's resulted in some pretty astonishing tape, some really astonishing tape. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, let us talk about how you can save money this year, okay? You know, even in down times, even when it appears the country is falling apart, it's still important that you don't spend too much money on things that you don't need to spend money on. One of those things is your cell phone bill. You're probably spending too much money on your cell phone bill, maybe up to twice as much as you ought to be spending because you've got that unlimited data that you're not actually using. Well, if you're using AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile, what if I told you that Pure Talk USA uses the exact same network as one of those carriers, same towers, same exact coverage, but literally will cost you half? How do they make it so affordable? Well, there are no retail stores, so low overhead. You're not funding their billion-dollar ad campaigns. You're only paying for the data you need. No contract, no excessive fees. You'll enjoy unlimited talk, text, and two gigs of data all for just 20 bucks a month. That's correct. The average person is saving $400 a year on their wireless bill. So go grab your mobile phone, dial pound 250, and say Ben Shapiro. When you do, you get this amazing deal and save 50% off your first month. Again, that is pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro. To get involved with Pure Talk USA, save a bunch of money on your cell phone bill. Go right now, dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro, and you get that amazing deal. You're saving up to 400 bucks a year on your wireless bill, and you save 50% off your first month just by dialing pound 250 and saying Ben Shapiro and joining Pure Talk USA. Okay, so the tape over the last 48 hours from Kenosha, Wisconsin, is absolutely astonishing. There is a, a looters were assaulting a, a business and a business owner charged out and started spraying them with a fire extinguisher, which is not a deadly weapon. It's a fire extinguisher. It is deadly to fire. And naturally, this led one of the looters to run over. Uh, looks like a young black man. Runs over, and he clocks this elderly business owner. A guy's probably 60, maybe. Hey, clocks hey, him directly hey. in the face, knocks him directly out. This is what's going to happen to every one of you when this goes nationwide. I don't think you realize this. Please, guys. We're trying to protect ourselves. Hey, you got alcohol in there? You don't understand what what, what, what terrifies these black men out here. They're not making it home to their family. Understand. What's that? How about that? Okay, it's that last lady I want to focus on, her commentary there. You don't understand. You don't understand. These black men out here, they're terrified for their lives. Oh, really? So that necessitates them looting stores and beating the living hell out of business owners. It seems like everything is okay, so long as the color of your skin is approved by the woke media. Very, very, it's an interesting take. It's an interesting take that basically you're in fear for your life. So you go and you break into a store and you steal crap. When the business owner shows up and sprays you the fire extinguisher, you literally beat him. That, that makes perfect sense. You're so fearful of the police officers that you do something illegal and then you beat a civilian. Makes perfect sense to me. Obviously, systemic racism. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, this unbelievable anti-logical shift has happened on the left. It used to be that the left was interested in fighting racism because they wanted people to have the ability to make free decisions and bear the consequences of those decisions. That was the purpose of getting rid of racism. Now, if you make a free and bad decision, we just blame racism. So racism becomes a tool rather than an obstacle. Using, using racism as a tool becomes a, a purposeful attempt to excuse awful and evil behavior like beating the living hell out of business owners and looting their businesses. Another tape came out from Kenosha yesterday. A BLM supporter telling members of the media that, you know what, when, when this sort of stuff happens, all right, because I feel their pain, I condone this sort of activity. Absolutely. I don't support violence, but people will see, people will come out and people will talk. When they feel it, you know what I'm saying? It's a feeling that's the only way you can make other people feel. And when they are being hurt, when their pockets are being hurt, then they will say something. So so by burning down buildings, that, that gives a voice to Black Lives Matter is what you're saying? I, I don't really, I condone them burning the building down. I condone them building and burning the buildings down. Yeah, man, because you know what? It's all part of the systemic racism narrative. The way that you... And systemic racism is by blaming all individual bad behavior on systemic racism. So the worse the behavior, the worse the systemic racism by by backwards logic. And now there are real costs to this. I know that the Democrats have been poo-pooing this and pretending it doesn't exist or making excuses for it in the ugliest possible fashion. But this has real consequences. So Julio Rosas over at uh, townhall.com has been doing some excellent on the ground reporting over in Kenosha. 
He interviewed a couple of business owners named Scott Carpenter and his mom, Linda. They owned a furniture store. It was completely burned to the ground. Absolutely burned to the ground. Okay, but, but apparently these costs don't matter. I'm not hearing a lot of empathy. Remember last week was all empathy week at the Democratic National Convention? Not seeing a lot of empathy for business owners who for no reason at all have their businesses completely burned to the ground by rioters and looters sporting the Black Lives Matter slogan. Here are these business owners who just watched their life savings disappear in smoke. We pay for insurance. That causes insurance rates to go up. It's basically theft. They just stole from us. Whoever did this stole from us. And that raises the cost of everything. Cost of living goes up because of theft. Cost of insurance goes up when when insurance claims have to be made. I don't think it's justified for anyone to ruin anybody else's property. It's against the law. They're already put in prison and or to have to be paid, made to pay back what they've destroyed. Nah, nah, why, nah. Well, of course not, that's silly, that's silly. Well, the predictable result of all of this is that business owners whose businesses are being left to the, to, to the handling, the tender mercies of rioters and looters who are being basically allowed to roam free by the governor of the state, Tony Evers. As I mentioned before, Tony Evers rejected more National Guard help. He was offered it. He put out a little statement, which was very important. His statement was, tonight and in the dark and in the days ahead, if you're going to protest, please do so peacefully and safely. Please do not allow the actions of a few to distract us from the work we must do together to demand justice, equity, and accountability. So big statement there from Governor Tony Evers. President Trump last night tweeted out, the governor should call in the National Guard in Wisconsin. It's ready, willing, and more than able. End the problem fast. It was now reported that local law enforcement in Wisconsin told the White House they needed at least 750 National Guard last night. Governor Evers sent 250. Today, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff at the White House, called the governor and offered 500 additional guards to meet the police needs, and Governor Evers declined. But he did release a statement. Ooh, a statement yesterday, Governor Evers. What a, what a wonderful governor he is, the governor of Wisconsin. Here was his statement. You ready? Listen to the harshness of the language he uses with regard to America versus the, the tender mercies that he uses with regard to people who are violently looting and burning things. Quote, The ability to exercise First Amendment rights is a critically important part of our democracy and the pursuit of justice. But there remains a line between peaceful assembly and what we saw last night that put individuals, families, and businesses in danger. We cannot forget the reason why these protests began. And what we have seen play out over the last two nights and many nights this year is the pain, anguish, and exhaustion of being black in our state and our country. Also, the natural consequence of of being black in the United States and black in Wisconsin is apparently putting individuals, families, and businesses in danger. I mean, that's his language, which is absolutely insane. It is derogatory toward black Americans. It assumes they have no agency. It assumes they cannot obey the law or should not obey the law given the status of black Americans in our society, which is patently loony. Here's Tony Evers, garbage governor. As I said yesterday, as I'll reiterate today, everyone should be able to exercise their fundamental right, whether a protester or member of the press, peacefully and safely. We cannot allow the cycle of systemic racism and injustice to continue. We also cannot continue going down this path of damage and destruction. Notice the disembodied language he uses with regard to damage and destruction. Nobody's actually doing anything bad. It's just that things are being seen that put individuals, families, and businesses in danger. It's absolutely passive language. Absolutely passive language. We're going down a path of damage and destruction. We. We are assessing the damage to state property and will be increasing the presence of the Wisconsin National Guard to ensure individuals can exercise their right safely, protect state buildings and critical infrastructure, and support first responders and firefighters. Tonight and in the days ahead, if you're going to protest, please do so peacefully and safely. Please do not allow the actions of a few to distract us from the work we must do together to ensure to demand justice, equity, and accountability. Okay, so that didn't work. According to the New York Times, here's what happened during the shootings. Quote, many protesters left the area. Others lingered and walked to a gas station several blocks away. There, a group of men with guns stood outside, promising to protect the property and verbally sparring with the arriving protesters. As the night stretched on, the gas station became a tense gathering spot with bystanders watching from parked cars and people milling around in the street, arguing and occasionally shoving each other. Police officers had crept closer to the gas stations in in armored trucks, urging the people who were still there to go home. After midnight, shots were fired outside the gas station. Three people were struck, according to Sheriff David Beth in an interview. The Kenosha Police Department said in a statement there were two fatalities. One person had been taken to the hospital with injuries that were not life-threatening. Sheriff Beth said the investigation was focused on the group of men with guns outside the gas station, and then investigators were scouring video taken just before the shooting. In one video, the men are shouting at each other and clutching their guns and occasionally pulling each other away to defuse the conflict. He said, I've had people saying, why don't you deputize the citizens? This is why you don't deputize citizens with guns to protect Kenosha. 
Okay, so now citizens are being put in the situation of you can't defend your own business because if you defend your own business and you get into an altercation and you shoot somebody, then obviously that's a bad thing. And also the cops can't defend your business. So presumably they should just allow all of this to, to happen. There's some video that has emerged of what appears to be a young white man who's being chased down by a, a group of protesters slash rioters and looters. And he falls to the ground. And when they approach him, he shoots them. And this is being used as proof positive of white racism, of course. Now, we don't know if all the people who were shot were white. We don't know. We know at least one person who was shot in the head was white. And that person apparently, according to reporting from the Daily Caller, was carrying a gun himself, I guess. Uh, was, that the, was that the report? It's all unclear. A lot of this is still up in the air, so I'm just going to bring you what I know at this point. There's one guy, there's video of Daily Caller, reporter helping the guy out, shot in the head as he was approaching a car dealership, presumably to do damage to the car dealership. That was one incident. That, then there was another incident in which several people were shot when it appears that a, a white young man, apparently about 17 years old, was carrying a gun and was being chased down, fell down on the street. And then when he was approached by people who looked like they were going to attack him, he turned around and he shot them. Okay, so all of this will be investigated. But here's the problem. Okay, chaos breaks out when you allow it to break out. You know why this stuff doesn't happen on a normal basis in the United States? Because we have police officers on the streets who are allowed to do their jobs. And we don't imply that every time they do do their jobs, they're a bunch of brutal racists. It turns out that when you imply that every situation without further evidence is evidence of police brutality and systemic racism, and then the cops are removed from situations People will defend their property. People will get violent. People will do stupid things on all sides. Rioters and looters and, and predators will attempt to prey on victims. People who don't want to be victimized will go out there and they will sometimes do things that are ill-advised, protecting themselves or their property or even not protecting themselves or their property. Chaos reigns when the mob rules. Chaos reigns when the mob rules. And that is what we are watching right now. The mob is ruling in Kenosha. This is what happens when you completely deride the police. On the basis of no evidence, by the way, okay, because I'm going to bring you some more evidence in the Jacob Blake case, it turns out that the entire original story, at least large parts of it, were a lie. We were told by Benjamin Crump that Jacob Blake was going to a house to break up a domestic disturbance, Good Samaritan Jacob Blake, who had a warrant out for three separate crimes, including one involving domestic abuse and another involving sexual assault, third degree sexual assault. Okay, but but he was he was the good guy there, according to Benjamin Crump, and then for no reason, the cops just gunned him down. Then there was video that emerged yesterday of Jacob Blake resisting arrest, fighting off the police officers. We still don't know what was in his hand. We still don't know what was in his car when he leaned into the car and then being shot. So that changed the story somewhat. Now we have the radio scanner audio of the call regarding the police. And you know what they show? It shows the police knew full well that there was an open warrant out for the guy. And he was apparently, according to the police scanner, the instigator of the incident that caused all of this to happen in the first place. He went to somebody's house where he wasn't supposed to be and he stole the woman's keys. He stole the woman's keys and that's why the cops got called in. And they were called in, presumably, by somebody who is a person of color. That's why the cops were there in the first place. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, there are a thousand reasons why protecting your home matters to you these days. You may have noticed it seems like you could use some more stuff to protect your house, to know what's going on on your property and directly outside your property. For me, it's peace of mind. I'm a public figure. I want to know who exactly is pulling up outside my house. But for you, it might be something as simple as you don't want somebody stealing boxes from your mailbox or you don't want somebody sneezing on a package directly before they put it in your mailbox. Ring has security products for every corner of your home, inside and out. Best of all, you can see it all in one simple app. With Ring, you can keep an eye on your home no matter where you are, directly from your phone. If somebody stops by or something is going on, Ring will let you know. It's peace of mind anytime knowing that your home is protected. You can see and speak to whoever is at your door from anywhere, literally anywhere thousands of miles away with video doorbells and keep an eye on every corner of your house with easy to install indoor and outdoor cams. That's good for me because I have kids who are constantly little suicide machines and I, I like to keep an eye on them by using the cameras. Get a special offer on the Ring Video Welcome Kit at ring.com slash Ben. It comes with Ring Video Doorbell 3 and Chime Pro. It is the perfect way to start your ring of security today. It's free two-day shipping. Go to ring.com slash Ben. That is ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Ring.com slash Ben. Okay, so... Here is some of the police audio of the of the the Blake call, the Jacob Blake call. It turns out that the police were called to the situation knowing there was a man there with an open warrant who was apparently harassing a woman and stealing her keys. So, no, he was not there, apparently, by the police audio to break up a fight. He was not a good Samaritan. He resisted arrest. We don't know what was in his hand. You don't walk away from the cops while they're pointing guns at your back and then reach into your car unless you want to get shot. That is an idiotic move. 
It doesn't mean that this is a fully justified shooting. It means it's going to be very difficult to prosecute police officers when literally you buck the police officers off your back, walk away from them while you're under, there's an open warrant for his arrest, right? They're arresting him. He bucks the police officers off his back and then he walks around the side of his car and reaches into the car. Okay, there's an open warrant out for domestic abuse and he's got three kids in the back of the car. What are they supposed to do? Let him go? Explain this to me. Seriously, explain this to me. But apparently this is worthy of burning down the entire city of Kenosha and every major politician in America claiming that this is an incident of police brutality and police racism. Here is some of the radio scanner audio of the Blake call that caused the police to show up in the first place. 18707 20 Street, 4040 Street. Complaint says Jacob Blake is not supposed to be there and he took the complaints keys and refused is refusing to get them back. Headquarters 618707 just for 43. We have a alert at this address for 99 for that subject. 7070 Street, we need rescue. Okay, within 40 seconds, the rescuers were on their way. That's why Jacob Blake is still alive. Okay, so they knew that he was a felon and there was an open warrant for him. He the 911 was called because he had stolen keys from a woman. Okay, this was not the case of innocent black man being pulled over by the police for no reason, complying with all police orders and then being shot for his trouble. That is not what this case was. Not from the beginning, not now. But it doesn't matter because our media and our politicians have an interest in polarizing the debate and suggesting that America is systemically racist and thus every flashpoint shooting that is caught on tape is evidence of police racism. This has driven piece of human debris, Sean King, an absolutely awful human being, to tweet out, and, and Bernie Sanders, delegate by the way, to the Kenosha Police Department, if you do not name the officer who brutally shot Jacob Blake on Sunday, we will simply begin naming officers from your department who may or may not be him. F it. Your protection of his identity is unethical. What's his name? Well, maybe they're not naming him because pieces of crap like Sean King are then going to activate a bunch of people to harass the police officer in the absence of evidence and the absence of an investigation. Maybe because this mob justice is no justice at all. It's just garbage people doing garbage things. Maybe it's that, Sean King. And by the way, the fact that Sean King is doing this is unbelievable considering that there is a person who actually committed suicide not all that long ago because Sean King misidentified him as a particular criminal. According to ABC13.com, this is just last year, Robert Paul Cantrell, 49, was found by staff at the Montgomery County Jail early on Tuesday, July 29th. He was found dead in his, uh, he was found dead in his cell. He was hanged in an apparent suicide. Staff tried to revive him and perform CPR. He was in jail on a charge of robbery evading. He was wrongly accused in the shooting death of a seven-year-old earlier this year. Why? Because Sean King put up a Twitter post of his picture. It was the wrong guy. So definitely, I want Sean King to be in charge of mob justice in the United States. Great move, everybody. Really, really strong stuff here. Mob justice is no justice. Social justice, by the way, is also no justice. Individual justice is the only kind of justice that matters. But have you noticed that people are studiously avoiding individual justice? We don't look at the individual circumstances of cases. All we do is we look at the color of the people involved and then make a snap decision on what exactly happened. I don't know what happened in these shootings last night. You don't either yet. We'll find out. I don't have all the details on Jacob Blake, but I'm happy to wait until all of the details come out. You know what nobody else is happy to do? Wait until all the details come out because they have a pre-existing narrative by which mob justice and social justice matter more than individual justice. The minute that you add any modifier to justice other than the word individual, you are now part of the bad guy crew. You are the problem, not the solution. Individual justice is the solution, not collective justice, not social justice, and certainly not the mob justice that we are seeing right now. Jamal Bowman who is a, a, a person who's about to enter Congress. He just took over Elliot Engel's seat in the primary. He's one of the new members of the squad. Here's what he tweeted out. We need Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to condemn the armed militias that killed two people in Kenosha yesterday while working in tandem with local police. These militias are domestic terrorists looking to incite a race war. Protecting private co property is cover for their agenda. So in other words, if you showed up and you protected your own private property, according to Jamal Bowman, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden should condemn you. But if you're there to burn down somebody's store, well, then you're a member of the good guy crew. Solid, solid stuff. And we're going to get to more of this. Honestly, the Republican National Convention should just show this crap on a loop, on a loop. Just forget the convention. The two hours tonight should just be dedicated to showing this stuff on a loop. Because this is the choice right now. Cave to this mob or don't cave to the mob. As we'll see, the mob is coming to your suburb soon. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, you know how strongly I believe in individual liberty and personal responsibility? Our founding fathers knew these were cornerstones of a great civilization, which is why they created the Second Amendment, so you can protect yourself. 
That said, owning a rifle is an awesome responsibility. Building rifles is no different, which is why I'm so impressed with the Bravo Company Manufacturing Company. The people at Bravo Company MFG support the right of responsible private individuals to have the access and ability to employ the same tools as civilian law enforcement as a means of defending ourselves, our loved ones, our communities, our freedoms, should a threatening situation ever arise. BCM assumes that when a rifle leaves their shop, it will be used in a life or death situation by a responsible citizen, law enforcement officer, or a soldier overseas. So quality is of utmost value. Every component of a BCM rifle is hand assembled and tested by Americans. As an American, you have the luxury of living in a free society where you can improve your life through education, religious exploration, and the open exchange of ideas. All of those rights in the end are guaranteed by your ability to protect yourself and your rights. To learn more, about Bravo Company Manufacturing, head on over to bravocompanymfg.com. You can discover more about their fantastic products, special offers, upcoming news. That is bravocompanymfg.com if you need more convincing. Find out even more about BCM and the awesome people who make their products at youtube.com slash bravocompanyusa. It's not enough that you should own a gun. You should know how to use it. You should also have a gun that works properly. And you should be a responsible, law-abiding, gun-owning citizen to protect yourself and protect your family. It's an important thing. Go check them out, bravocompanymfg.com. Okay, so again, there are real consequences to this sort of insanity. Consequences on a life on a life basis. I mean, people were shot last night in Kenosha, not by the cops. Okay, they were shot last night. There are consequences to business. There's a place called Gravity Gaming Lounge that posted this on Facebook last night. Quote, for those that heard, we got looted. Everything in the store was taken. The place was destroyed. For a business that was struggling to get back to normal and pushing through these hard times, we will not be able to come back from this. The damage to our building, the cost to replace the exterior damage and to top it off to replace everything stolen is going to be catastrophic. As we look to see the total cost, at this point, we'll be closing down completely. And this is what happens in cities when you allow all of this crap to happen, when all of this crap is allowed to run roughshod. Where the mob rules, again, chaos follows. And that is what you're seeing. And you're seeing it spread into the suburbs. This is not relegated to high crime areas anymore. You're starting to see people being harassed in public places. Remember that time? When it was just about, if you're a Trump official, we're going to yell at you at a restaurant. Well, no longer. Now, we're just going to yell at you no matter where you are. There was a, a, an unbelievable tape yesterday of a crew of people harassing a woman at a Washington, D.C. outdoor restaurant. She's just sitting there. By the way, she says that she's repeatedly marched with Black Lives Matters. She just was not going to be bullied into doing anything by a mob. So good for her. Good for her. Well done, everybody here in the crowd. Apparently, one of the people who was doing this crap was a writer for Deadspin. His name was Modiano. His name was Modiano. And this Modiano character, Chuck Modiano, he, um, he decided that he couldn't understand why she was the only diner in the area who wouldn't comply with the demand. What was in you? You couldn't do this? And Victor, who's an urban planner, the, name, the woman's name is, um, is Victor. Her, na- her name is Lauren B. Victor. She said, I felt I was under attack. She said that there was something wrong about being coerced to show support. She said, I wasn't actually frightened. I didn't think they'd do anything to me. I'm very much with them. them. I've been marching with them for weeks and weeks and weeks. But here's Captain Deadspin over here bullying a woman and getting in her face and screaming in her face in the middle of a COVID pandemic. So solid stuff here from your BLM crew. So we get malice shaming mobs. This is really exciting stuff. So now, we are the, now the, the, the law is on the side of the mob. It's on the side of the bullies. Now, you, some of the great heroes in American history are people who withstood the mob to stand up for their rights. And people like John Lewis literally withstood a racist mob to sit and just take a milkshake at a, at a lunch counter, right? That, that is great American heroism. Now, the same people claiming John Lewis's mantle are trying to shout people into submission and bully them into putting up a fist. Okay, if you're trying to claim John Lewis's mantle and you're doing that, you're a piece of crap. Meanwhile, more people were being threatened at dining yesterday. Here was, uh, here's another tape from Washington, D.C., where people were being mobbed and shouted at for the great crime of not raising a fist in solidarity with this Marxist BLM organization. Here, is, here, here we go. How delightful. Apparently, the people being bullied here also work with people who have mental instability issues. I'm not kidding. Mental instability issues disproportionately minority. Those are the people being screamed at here. That is what the social media has found. So again, incredibly, incredibly well done. And of course, things have not let up in Portland. Last night in Portland, things continued to be riotous. There were more riots in Portland last night. The governor of of Oregon was like, you know, it'd be great if you stopped this violence. Oh, has that occurred to you? We're now three months in. And in Seattle, according to my friend Jason Rantz over at KTTH, 
Seattle rioters used a substance suspected to be quick dry concrete to seal shut the door to the East Precinct, the Seattle Police Department has confirmed. And then a rioter attempted to set fire to the building after concreting people in the building. Now, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives is working with the Seattle PD on this investigation. Rioters assaulted Seattle's East Precinct on Monday night. This marked another night of violent criminal activism against police officers unconnected to anger over a recent police shooting in Wisconsin. According to KTTH, as some in the crowd vandalized the building and tormented police, others brought quick dry cement to seal police officers inside the building. So just wonderful, wonderful behavior all the way around. Good thing that they slashed the salary of the police chief in Seattle, Carmen Best, forcing her to quit. The black female police chief of Seattle was now quit. So all of this, it turns out, is not redounding to the benefit of Democrats, which led Don Lemon to say the quiet part out loud, which is, guys, the rioting and the looting were all fine. And, you know, the beating of people in the streets and the bullying, all of that was fine. But now people are starting to become aware. So probably Joe Biden should say something about it. Here was Don Lemon saying, oh, you know, it was fine until it started to affect the, Dem the Democrats' poll numbers. And I think this is a blind spot for Democrats. I think Democrats are ignoring this problem or hoping that it will go away. And it's not going to go away. And so unless someone comes up with a solution over the next 73 days or 70 so however many days 68 days 68 days so it's not going to the the problem is not going to be fixed by then but what they can do and i think maybe joe biden may be afraid to do it i'm not sure maybe he won't maybe he is he's got to address it he shouldn't he should address it not because it's bad you see he should address it because it's going to affect his poll numbers you see the narrative must always be maintained. And when Joe Biden addresses it, what he should discuss is systemic American racism, of course. That's the real problem. He should discuss systemic American racism and why it's leading to rioting and looting. So uh, uh, there are no words. for the, the, the media are complicit in this kind of crap, by the way. I'm gonna get to that in a second because the media are absolutely complicit. They are pushing it. They continue to push false narratives about police action in the absence of evidence. They've been doing it for literally years. Every major incident of the last five years, probably, has been misconstrued by the media originally without waiting for any of the available facts. Actively misconstrued by the media. Every single one. I'm, I'm struggling to think of one that has not been misconstrued. Maybe the, the only one I can think of is Fulano Castile. That is the only one that I can think of that has not been actively misconstrued or miscovered by the media. The Freddie Gray situation in Baltimore was, was considered an act of police racism. The autopsy found that the police did not, in fact, beat Freddie Gray to death or purposefully kill Freddie Gray. The Eric Garner incident was considered an act of police racism, despite the fact that the sergeant on duty and who was watching over all of it was black. And the fact that Eric Garner died of the fact of his pre-existing conditions, he did not actually die of being choked out in that particular situation. Doesn't mean he should have died, but the original details are not the original story. The Rashard Brooks shooting is a situation where a man took a taser, tased two cops, wrestled them to the ground, and then was shot for his trouble. The Michael Brown shooting was not a situation of a black man surrendering to police, hands up, don't shoot. It was a lie. It was a lie from the beginning. The, the, the media went with it anyway. It is difficult to think of a situation where the media did not miscover the situation dramatically and in the wrong direction from the very outset, declaring that it was a symptom of deeper underlying American racism. And we're watching that right now in a variety of cases, in a variety of cases. I'll get to more details on that in just one second. The deep irresponsibility of our media that have one job, and that is to actively report the facts, not to report a narrative, not to report the 1619 Project's lies about America, to report the fact and their abject irresponsibility and refusal to do so is leading to what we are seeing in the streets right now. And get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about your hair. OK, if you're a dude, good shot that you're going to lose your hair. And when we get into our 20s and 30s and start noticing the first signs of hair loss, well, it's panic time. And that is why you need to go get the medication you need to make sure that you don't go bald. Two out of three dudes are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they are 35. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. You used to have to go to a doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. Now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered directly to your home. They make it easy. They deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but never for this price. Prevention is key. Keeps treatments typically take between four and six months to see results, so it is important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you will save. 
There's a reason that keeps treatment start at just 10 bucks a month. Plus, for a limited time, you can get your first month for free. So that's a fantastic deal for getting to keep your hair. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Ben to receive your first month of treatment for free. I've used it myself because male pattern baldness does run in my family. That is K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Ben, keeps.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Okay, we're going to get to the dramatic media miscoverage of nearly every major police-involved incident of the last several years. But first, the RNC is off to a great start, blowing the DNC out of the water in nearly every way. In fact, online, C-SPAN viewership, six times the opening night of the DNC, which is a huge number. Daily Wire is matching this enthusiasm with an even better lineup of All Access Live to watch the RNC with you over at dailywire.com. Starting tonight at 8.15 p.m. Eastern, 5.15 p.m. Pacific, our own Matt Walsh will be once again sacrificing himself for you. He'll be live streaming the entire night of RNC speakers and watching with you, taking your comments and questions, letting you know what he thinks in real time. And we'll be hosting more live watch parties every day for the rest of the week, so do not miss out. All Access members get to join these All Access live sessions where one of us jumps on every night to chat with you both in live stream and in the comments. All Access membership also features not one, but two leftist tiers tumblers with your membership as well as early and sometimes exclusive access to new Daily Wire products. So head on over to dailywire.com slash Shapiro right now to get 20% off all access with coupon code access. That's dailywire.com slash Shapiro with coupon code access to get 20% off your membership. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So our garbage media continuing to try out false story after false story, not to look at details, to ignore the realities of situations on the ground. So the one obviously that is most celebrated is George Floyd, in which Derek Chauvin supposedly murdered George Floyd, like murdered him. They're, they're going to charge him with second degree murder, which is a completely ungettable charge. Okay, Keith Ellison is not going to be able to, to get a conviction on that charge. Prediction right now, not based on the available fact. Now, Derek Chauvin may have engaged in assault. He may have engaged in police brutality. There is no evidence that he murdered George Floyd at this point. Okay, the autopsies, there have been a couple of separate autopsies. George Floyd did not die of asphyxiation from Derek Chauvin. In fact, there is now a Hennepin County Attorney's Office memorandum that has been released. The, this was a, a medical examination that was done by Dr. Andrew Baker. Okay, he did the final toxicology results on George Floyd's blood samples. And he analyzed a, a bunch of factors. And here's what he found. The, Dr. Baker said, that he walked down the list of substances for which the labs tested. He said that there were low levels of methamphetamine. But when it came to fentanyl, he said the fentanyl levels were, quote, pretty high. It was an 11, apparently. This level of fentanyl can cause pulmonary edema. Mr. Floyd's lungs were two to three times their normal weight at autopsy. That is a fatal level of fentanyl under normal circumstances. According to the doctor, if Floyd had been found dead in his home or anywhere else, and there were no other contributing factors, he would conclude it was an overdose death. So in other words, you actually have to show causation if you're going to show murder. Okay, it's very difficult to show causation in this particular case. This was true from the original county autopsy. It's going to remain true. You're not going to hear any of that. The media are just going to ignore it. They're going to ignore it because they have to claim that Derek Chauvin is not only a murderer, but also he's a racist. So even if he had killed George Floyd, there's still no evidence he's a racist. We're waiting on that. Doesn't matter. The media ran with the story anyway. It's systemic police racism, systemic police brutality and cruelty. And they're going to ignore the fact that George, the tape shows that George Floyd was saying he couldn't breathe before he was on the ground, that he was resisting arrest. They're going to avoid the fact that Minneapolis police procedure allows you to put somebody in a submission hold in that way if you believe that they are suffering from a particular type of condition. Okay, I've read you the manual before. Okay, it's going to be very difficult to receive a conviction on that basis. So the media have yet to actually fulfill their pledge on what happened to George Floyd. Doesn't matter. The narrative has been set. Derek Chauvin is a racist murderer. In the Breonna Taylor death, Oprah Winfrey is taking out full-on billboards about Breonna Taylor's death. Now, the original claim is that Breonna Taylor was the girlfriend of a guy who was a drug dealer and that she had nothing to do with the drug dealing, right? She, she was not involved in any way, that they basically falsified an arrest warrant to go to Breonna Taylor's apartment and search her apartment, but they had no real basis for doing so. And so, therefore, the warrant was flawed. Okay, then there's a dispute as to what happened. They had a no-knock warrant to go into Breonna Taylor's apartment. They knocked anyway, right? By all accounts, they knocked anyway. According to Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, who is still alive, the, the alleged drug dealer, he, they, they did not announce themselves. And so when they started to force in the door, he took a shot at them, at which point they shot into the apartment and they shot him and killed Breonna Taylor. Now, number one, if they have a no-knock warrant, they don't actually have to announce themselves. Number two, the police say they did announce themselves. So even that is in dispute. But the entire case that the cops are going to be criminally liable for any charges in the Breonna Taylor shooting 
are likely to rest on the insufficiency of the warrant itself. The suggestion that the warrant was falsified. Well, earlier this month, ABC News reported that experts say there are serious obstacles to charging police in the Breonna Taylor case. Attorney General Daniel Cameron, the first African-American elected to the job in Kentucky, spoke at the RNC last night, has declined to put a timetable on his decision since taking over the case in May. According to Christopher Slobogin, director of the criminal justice program at Vanderbilt University, he said it's a tough issue. He has to figure out whether there's probable cause to believe there was an unreasonable use of force. Difficult to make that case when somebody is literally shooting at you from inside an apartment. Taylor's boyfriend, Kenny Walker, was with her at the apartment and fired a shot at Louisville, uh, Louisville Police Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly after the door was broken down. Mattingly was struck in the leg and returned fire, along with other officers who were outside the apartment. Taylor was unarmed. She was shot several times in her hallway and died on the scene. The officers were not wearing body cameras. There's no video of the raid. The warrant they were carrying has come under scrutiny, and the police lieutenant who sought it, Joshua Jaynes, has been placed on administrative leave during the investigation. Attorneys for Taylor's family said it was based on erroneous information that a drug dealer was sending packages to Taylor's apartment. So according to the experts, Sam Markison, University of Louisville law professor, he says the warrant, combined with the fact that they were fired upon, would make for a powerful defense argument that they acted in valid self-defense while conducting a lawful police operation. Basically, they have to prove several things to prove that these officers should go to jail. One, they would have to show that the warrant were obtained fraudulently. Two, they would have had to show the officers were aware that the warrant was obtained fraudulently. Police department protocol allows the use of lethal force when officers feel threatened. Even if they had a valid no-knock warrant and properly announced themselves, blazing away could theoretically be an excessive use of force. But when somebody is firing at you, that sort of changes the math a little bit. So in other words, it's going to be nearly impossible to reach conviction in the Breonna Taylor case. And if somebody's firing at you from inside an apartment where you have a warrant, a justly based warrant, how do you make the case that the police officers ought to go to jail? That, that is just called a tragedy. It is not necessarily called a crime. Okay, well, now it turns out there are new details. Now there are new details, new details that are being largely ignored by the national media. They're being covered locally. According to the Courier Journal, the, the Louisville Courier, Courier Journal, apparently there's a new report. It's a 39-page report, and it details significant ties beyond, between Breonna Taylor and the alleged drug dealer. So this is only relevant. It's not relevant to her being shot. It is relevant to whether they properly obtained the warrant. If it turns out there was significant evidence that Breonna Taylor was part of a drug distribution network, then it would make sense that they had a no-knock warrant for her apartment. So again, you have to fulfill three steps to convict the Breonna Taylor officers. One, you have to claim that the arrest warrant was fraudulent. Two, the officers knew it was fraudulent. Three, they then went in guns blazing to shoot somebody. All three of these are going to be found false. Doesn't matter. The narrative has already been set. According to the Courier Journal, an internal report written by Louisville Metro Police after officers fatally shot Breonna Taylor on March 13th sheds more light on the reasons why they chose to forcibly enter her South End apartment the night she was killed. The 39-page report and corroborating evidence show Taylor had more extensive ties than previously made public with an accused drug trafficker who was at the center of a larger narcotics operation in Louisville. Apparently, according to the report, Corroborated by jail phone recordings and other documents obtained by the Courier Journal, detail multiple links between Taylor and Jamarcus Glover of Louisville, a main target in a drug probe that prompted police to request the search warrant for Taylor's apartment. Plainclothes officers that night battered in her door searching for drugs and illicit cash. None were found. Glover was arrested the same night as Taylor's shooting. He was picked up at an alleged drug house 10 miles to the north in Louisville's West End. Okay, so it is unclear whether prosecution should take place here of the officers. It is certainly not clear that this arrest warrant and the and the warrant that was out for opening up the apartment, the no-knock warrant, was improperly based. Of course, the mayor condemned the release of the report because only one side of the information can get out. When you're condemning information for being dropped, that's generally an indicator that you don't like the information that is being dropped. Apparently, the Courier Journal reported that a sworn affidavit, affidavit from the Louisville Metro Police Department detective Joshua Jaynes said Glover, who was the boyfriend, was seen walking into Taylor's apartment one January afternoon and left with, with a suspected USPS package in his right hand and dro dr then drove to a known drug house on Muhammad Ali Boulevard. Jaynes said he verified through a U.S. postal inspector Glover had been receiving packages at Taylor's address. As the police report reviewed by the Courier Journal goes beyond the information in the affidavit, it details evidence into police surveillance of Taylor and Glover, as well as recorded phone conversations from the jail involving the two of them. Okay, so again, these are new details that you probably will not see a lot in the national media because the narrative has been set that the police officers did something deeply wrong and not only wrong, racist. The, the only way that you can explain 
the consistent pattern of the media refusing to cover in, in the national press. The details of these cases before allowing the jump to the conclusion that the police are systemically racist is because they have an agenda. America is systemically racist. Remove the cops and give Democrats power and all this will go away. Amazing. Okay, so as I say, none of this makes for a better America. None of it. If you can name something that has gotten better in America over the last several months since the George Floyd killing, then uh, I'm willing to hear it. But I have yet to hear a single thing, one, like a thing that has gotten better. We've been told that America is getting better day by day because of the BLM movement. I'm waiting to see evidence that this is the case. I've not seen any evidence that this is the case, in fact. And in fact, most Americans have gone back to their prior opinions of what they thought the state of the state of the state of play was before BLM really gained national prominence again after the George Floyd death. And so all of this was the backdrop for the RNC last night. Well, the RNC last night was sort of a kind and friendly RNC last night. In fact, the RNC actually opened with a prayer for Jacob Blake as well as the police. Here was the beginning of the RNC night two. I'm going to invite you to join your faith with mine, and let's pray in agreement. Lord, we come before you to ask for your spirit of peace to come over hurting communities in Wisconsin tonight. We pray for healing and comfort to Jacob Blake and his family. We pray for your protection over those who put their lives in harm's way to bring safety and security to our streets. So that's how the RNC opened, right? Kinder, gentler RNC. Now, it seems to me that with the Democrats in absolute hiding over all of this, Joe Biden refuses to condemn it. Joe Biden refuses to condemn the rioting and the looting and the violence. All he does is mouth platitudes about systemic racism with no possible solutions in sight, except for elect the octogenarian Democrat who's done nothing over the course of his career to alleviate racial tensions and actually significant things to exacerbate racial tensions and who was called a racist by his own VP candidate five minutes ago. Right, that's the agenda here. And where, where is he? Where is he? The cities are burning. Where is he? The mob is ruling. Where is he? And so the, the RNC is happening against that basis. And the RNC pursued several different themes last night. It was a more typical RNC night. Uh, they, they pursued some issues on foreign policy. They pursued some issues on the media. A lot of attention to the media last night. Well-deserved because the media are just an arm of the Democratic Party at this point, pushing a narrative rather than a factual fact pattern. Nick Sandman was featured here and the media went nuts. Right, so Nick, they should. He, he literally is now an owner of CNN. <laughs> so Nick Sandman, of course, is the is the teenager who is targeted by the media as a racist for the great crime of standing there wearing a MAGA hat as a Native American activist got in his face and banged a drum in his face, along with members of the black Hebrew Israelites. Well, Nick Sandman spoke at the RNC last night about the full war machine of the media. Absolutely true and necessary. What I thought was a strange encounter quickly developed into a major news story complete with video footage. My life changed forever in that one moment. The full war machine of the mainstream media revved up into attack mode. They did so without researching the full video of the incident, without ever investigating Mr. Phillips' motives, or without ever asking me for my side of the story. And do you know why? Because the truth was not important. Correct. The truth is not important to the media. I mean, Nick Sandman going after the media last night, the media lost it. The media lost it. A CNN analyst named Joe Lockhart, he actually tweeted out that this kid, he said, I'm watching tonight because it's important, but I don't have to watch this snot-nosed entitled kid from Kentucky. Yeah, I feel like the the lack of self-awareness in the media is half the problem here. It is at least half the problem. So the RNC, again, has been a well-run operation. It's technically nice to look at. I mean, like it's, it's well produced. And there were several themes last night. The biggest theme of the RNC overall continues to be that Trump is really not what this election is about. So the entire DNC was based around the idea that Trump is the election. But as it turns out, many Americans looking at what's happening on their TVs now and looking at it on the internet, because you can only get the news from the internet now, from center-right sources, they, they are beginning to realize that this election is not about Trump. It's in fact about movements in the country. One movement that suggests that the mob ought to rule that the protesters ought to be treated as wonderful and good, even if they evolve into rioters and looters over the course of the night, that they are the best among us, as Barack Obama suggested. And another group of people who say, you know what? You're allowed to protest. You are not allowed to riot. You are not allowed to loot. We still have a republic here, and the mob does not rule here. The, The mob should not be given one inch. It should not be given one inch. And the idea of the Democratic Party, that the mob should rule in the absence of Democratic rule, and that if Democrats do rule, then the mob should basically go away because the mob's agenda has been channeled into legislation, That is an ugly, ugly uh, election item. You're going to watch the polls narrow. You're already starting to see the polls narrow. This is not going to be a blowout election, not if the Democrats continue 
to give way to the mob. Americans do not like the mob. Americans like their republic. And the only way they're going to keep it is if they back it. Don't give one shred or iota of power to people who promulgate false narratives on the basis of lack of fact and then give credence to mobs of rioters and looters and violent thugs in order to do so. Okay, don't, don't do it. Don't give those people one iota of power. They don't deserve it. Okay, so again, the RNC happens last night. It was, it was a bit of a different RNC night. Uh, sort of a wide variety of people who were speaking. There were some really, I thought, good moments. And they pointed out the radicalism of the Democratic agenda. So one of the people who spoke was Sissy Graham Lynch, who was the, daughter, the granddaughter of Billy Graham. And she points out that one of the agenda items for so many of the Democrats is to silence faith, which obviously is true. Joe Biden has suggested that little sisters of the poor nuns should be paying for contraceptive coverage. Joe Biden has reversed himself on the Hyde Amendment. He says that you should pay for abortions. Kamala Harris has suggested that religion essentially ought to be relegated to the private sphere, that if you run a business, you should not be allowed to live out your religion in everyday life. Here was Sissy Graham Lynch talking about how faith was not supposed to be silenced in the United States. It's why we have a First Amendment. We know the first line of the First Amendment protects our freedom of religion. But what we often forget, the actual words are free exercise of religion. That means living out our faith in our daily lives, in our schools, in our jobs, and yes, even in the public square. Our founders did not envision a quiet, hidden faith. They fought to ensure that the voices of faith were always welcomed, not silenced, not bullied. Hey, she, of course, is ripped up and down because how dare she say things about faith? No one's trying to silence your faith except for the Democratic Party agenda, which actually wants to make faith subservient to whatever is the government's social position of the day. Abby Johnson also spoke. She, of course, is an advocate on behalf of life. She used to be a, a branch manager uh, at an abortion clinic for Planned Parenthood. Uh, she used to be one of the chief pro-choice advocates in the country, and now she is extremely pro-life. The media came for her last night um, because the media decided that she is very bad. MSNBC cut away from this, by the way. They went to commercial break while Abby Johnson was speaking, specifically because you're not allowed in the mainstream media to graphically discuss what abortion constitutes. This is the one thing you're not allowed to do. You're allowed to pretend that abortion is just reproductive health care. One of the things you're not supposed to do is openly discuss what abortion is, which is one of the reasons why every time I speak about abortion publicly, I do exactly what Abby Johnson does here. When I'm at the March for Life, I graphically discuss what an abortion is and what the feelings of the baby are and how well-developed children are in the womb. I did it on Fox News. In fact, when I was on Fox News and I, ha I did an election special in 2018, I did a full segment on abortion and I actually wanted to show pictures of unborn babies in the womb and some graphic images. And even Fox News, which is a, which is a right-wing network, wouldn't let me do it. We had to show animations instead. Here was Abby Johnson last night graphically discussing abortion at the RNC, which is, by the way, what you should discuss. You know, we, we've been told that to raise awareness, you should discuss the graphic nature of real events on the ground. Unless it's an abortion, then you just, you know, brush it away with some euphemisms. A physician asked me to assist with an ultrasound guided abortion. Nothing prepared me for what I saw on the screen. An unborn baby fighting back, desperate to move away from the suction. And I'll never forget what the doctor said next. Beam me up, Scotty. The last thing I saw was a spine twirling around in the mother's womb before succumbing to the force of the suction. Okay, now I know there are a bunch of Democrats who are like, oh, how could she be so graphic? Because... Would you like to know what goes on or would you like to shield your eyes from, from what exactly goes on? So honestly, I think it's an important message and I think it's a, it's a good message and I'm glad that Abby Johnson spoke it. Okay, other elements of the RNC last night, Mike Pompeo was ripped up and down for the great sin. He violated the Hatch Act, we are told, the Hatch Act. Okay, so the Hatch Act uh, is generally unenforceable. <laughs> it's very rarely enforced. The Hatch Act basically says you're not allowed to use public resources to push politics. This happens all the time. Okay, seriously, like if you think public officials don't push politics on public grounds, uh, you're out of your mind. And the Obama administration violated the Hatch Act seven ways from Sunday by this broad iteration of it. By the way, six separate cabinet secretaries spoke on behalf of Barack Obama in 2012. But when Mike Pompeo speaks from Jerusalem on behalf of Donald Trump, then apparently that's very bad. Here was Mike Pompeo, the secretary of state, speaking on behalf of the Trump foreign policy, which, by the way, again, his Middle Eastern policy has achieved the first serious peace deal in the region since 1994. And Donald Trump is being given no credit in the media by it, like literally no credit. Here is Mike Pompeo talking about it. This president has led bold initiatives in nearly every corner of the world, in China, 
He has pulled back the curtain on the predatory aggression of the Chinese Communist Party in North Korea. The president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. The president, too, moved the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. And just two weeks ago, the president brokered a historic peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Okay, so honestly, that is good. I mean, the fact is that they had John Kerry speak about Trump's foreign policy and rip into it. Uh, they had Barack Obama do some of the same sort of stuff. Uh, they, they had a wide variety of, def of political figures from the Democratic Party rip into Trump's foreign policy. I'm glad that Pompeo defended the foreign policy. I think that they're very stupid president. I mean, I said, by the way, I thought it was a stupid precedent that presidents couldn't rip their, their heirs. Like, I think George W. Bush should have had some things to say about Barack Obama. I, I don't care. They're politicians. This, this idiotic notion that politicians shouldn't speak politically once they're off the stage or that if you're the secretary of state, we have to assume that you're a nonpartisan political figure is asinine in the extreme. So and not only am I not hypocritical on it, I actually said it last week with regard to Barack Obama. These are precedents that just don't matter. I'm glad that Mike Pompeo spoke at the RNC. OK, it was also family night at the RNC. Uh, there's a lot of Trump, a lot of Trump. So Tiffany Trump spoke. And she points out the differences between right and left. I thought Tiffany Trump did a pretty good job of pointing out the differences between right and left. She said, here are some of the things that we believe in as Americans. If you believe in these, you should probably join us. We believe in equality of opportunity. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want. Seek out the truth. Learn from those with different opinions. And then freely make your voice heard to the world. We believe in school choice because a child's zip code in America should not determine their future. We believe in freedom of religion for all faiths. And we believe in the American spirit. Hey, she did a good job last night, Tiffany. So did Eric. Eric spoke last night. He said that one of the big conflicts here is there's a group of people who would like to erase American history and there's a group of people who would like to preserve American history. Here is Eric Trump speaking last night. In the view of the radical Democrats, America is the source of the world's problems. As a result, they believe the only path forward is to erase history and forget the past. They want to destroy the monuments of our forefathers. They want to disrespect our flag, burn the stars and stripes that represent patriotism and the American dream. They want to disrespect our national anthem by taking a knee while our armed forces lay down their lives every day to protect our freedom. Again, these contrasts are very useful to Republicans. The DNC was largely about pasting over a, a bubbling pot of anti-American sentiment. You know, no under God in the Pledge of Allegiance in the early hours of the DNC. You can kneel for the national anthem. America is systemically racist with some Joe Biden sort of pasteboard patriotism where he talks about how much he goes to church and how much he loves the American flag and, and all of this kind of stuff. And the fact is that it goes a little bit deeper than that for a lot of Republicans. By the way, this is what the polls show. The polls show that Democrats are patriotic when Democrats are in office. And when Republicans are in office, the patriotism dives. Republicans have generally been patriotic whether or not a Democrat is in office. Okay, the polls do show this. Gallup has been showing this for years. Okay, then Melania spoke. And even the media were forced to acknowledge that Melania did a good job last night. Here was Melania Trump really taking on a couple of issues. She took on racial unrest and she took on COVID. And she actually provided a voice of reason on these particular issues. She said, I'm not going to spend tonight attacking the other side the way the Democrats have been. As you have heard this evening, I don't want to use this precious time attacking the other side. Because as we saw last week, that kind of talk only serves to divide the country further. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. He's what is best for our country. OK, and then Melania got into COVID and she acknowledged that people are worried about COVID. But she points out the federal government has been doing its best to, to prevent the transmission. By the way, there are upticks in Europe right now. Again, nobody has a great strategy on COVID. It burns through communities. The best you can do is protect the vulnerable and encourage people to take steps to slow the spread by keeping social distancing and wearing masks in crowded areas. That is literally all you can do. There are no other answers. Here's Melania Trump talking about COVID. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My husband's administration will not stop fighting until there is an effective treatment or vaccine available to everyone. 
Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. And Melania Trump also took a nuanced view of American history. Now, this is something we've been told Republicans can't do, which is amazing because in my new book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps, I think I took a pretty nuanced view of American history, pointing out all of its flaws. Melania did the same thing last night. We've been told Republicans refuse to acknowledge the flaws of American history. That obviously is not the case. Like all of you, I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history. I encourage people to focus on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. And she concluded by saying, we should all come together in a civil manner. I mean, this is a very mild and well-spoken speech. It granted a sense of normalcy to the convention in a time of great abnormalcy. Again, the Joe Biden pitch has been return to normalcy, but things were not normal under Barack Obama. They have not been normal under President Trump. And they are not normal right now while Democrats completely ignore the fact that we are watching our cities burn. Here is Melania Trump trying to provide that sense of normalcy. We still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice. Okay, all of this prompted Bette Midler, great Democratic mind, Bette Midler, to tweet, oh God, she still can't speak English. So you can say that about Melania now, so that's exciting. That she, she can speak English, and I, I guarantee you she speaks, at, what, five or six other languages? She speaks all of them better than Bette Midler speaks any of those languages. In any language, Bette Midler is a, is, is a fool. Even Politico acknowledged, this was their analysis, quote, First Lady Melania Trump restored a sense of normalcy Tuesday night, closing night two with a speech that was remarkable for its restraint and deliberate adherence to etiquette. That's a very strong night again, night two, for the RNC reaching out to people in the middle who may be somewhat alienated by the fact that our cities are burning and the media continue to root for it and continue to say the only reason Democrats might want to address it is because their poll numbers are starting to drop. Okay, we'll be back here a little bit later today with two additional hours of content. Otherwise, we'll be back here tomorrow with much, much more. All the updates on RNC night three, I believe Vice President Pence goes tonight, and all the updates as Kenosha, Wisconsin burns, among other cities. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pava Wydowski. Our associate producer is Nick Sheehan. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about about politics. I think there are enough of those already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith. Those are fundamental and that's what this show is about. I hope you'll give it a listen. Hold up. 